I hope everyone uh, gave their significant other, other plenty, plenty of uh, good love uh, and uh, appreciation today. So for a uh, senator from the 29th, that is Valentine's Day. I just want to remind you of that. So. And, uh, it is time. The time for convening has arrived. The Senate will come to order. At this time, I will ask all unauthorized personnel to exit the chamber. I recognize the senator from the 28th. Reading of the journal. Thank you, Mr. President. Happy Valentine's Day to you. I appreciate that. Uh, first off, I want to introduce our pages today. I've got one hailing out of Noonan, Georgia. I grew up with his mama, Peyton Bass. Peyton, thank you for being here. Connor Brewer. Connor, thank you for being here. Joel Titus. Those two are from Jefferson, Georgia. And we have Grayson James out of Cumming. And we have Sana Scipio. I probably said that wrong, but she's out of Atlanta. Thank you to our pages. We appreciate all the good work you're going to do for us today and the citizens of Georgia. All right. Thank you, hand. pages. Mr. President, a couple interesting facts about this day in history. On this day in 1867, Morehouse College was organized in Augusta, Georgia, which I found very interesting. And in, on this day in 1899, U.S. Congress began using voting machines. Really? And uh, yeah, that's a true story. Today is Frederick Douglass Day, Library Lovers Day, National Have a Heart Day, National Pet Theft Awareness Day, and of course, Valentine's Day. Mr. President, the journal has been read and found to be correct. Thank you, Senator. Is there objection to dispensing of the reading of the journal? Chair hears none. The reading of the journal is dispensed with. Is there objection to the confirmation of the journal? Chair hears none, and the journal is confirmed. All senators who have bills and resolutions introduced, please bring them to the Secretary's desk. First reading and references to Senate bills. Secretary? Senate Bill 151 by Senator James of the 35th and others, a bill to be entitled an act relating to holidays and observances so as to designate September 11th of each year as First Responders Appreciation Day in Georgia and to provide for related matters. Rules. Senate Bill 152 by Senator James of the 35th and others, a bill to be entitled an act relating to general provisions related to the General Assembly so as to provide for cardio. Rules. Senate Bill 153 by Senator Beach of the 21st and others, a bill to be entitled an act relating to specific business and occupation taxes so as Finance. to authorize. Senate Bill 154 by Senator Dolezal of the 27th and others, a bill to be entitled an act relating to sale or distribution of harmful materials to minors so as to provide that the provisions of code Education and youth. Senate Bill 155 by Senator Kirkpatrick of the 32nd and others, a bill to be entitled an act relating to general provisions relative to dangerous instrumentalities and practices so as to revise provisions relating to harming of law Public enforcement safety. animal. Senate Bill 156 by Senator Robertson of the 29th and Harbison of the 15th, a bill to be entitled an act relating to county-specific purpose local option sales tax so as to authorize Finance. consolidated. Senate Bill 157 by Senator Strickland of the 17th and others, a bill to be entitled an act relating to education, food, drugs, and cosmetics, health, insurance, and professions and businesses, respectively, so as to create judiciary. Senate Bill 158 by Senator Robertson of the 29th and others, a bill to be entitled an act relating to property property insurance so as to provide for an insurance premium discount or rate reduction for property insurance owners. and labor senate bill 159 by senator robertson of the 29th and others a bill to be entitled an act to relating to general provisions regarding correctional institutions of states and counties so as to prohibit wireless communications and standalone electronic devices behind guard lines to Public provide for penalties Senate Bill 160 by Senator Still of the 48th and others, a bill to be entitled an act relating to labor and industrial re relations so as to change certain provisions relating Insurance to employment and labor. security. Senate Bill 161 by Senator Kennedy of the 18th and others, a bill to be entitled an act relating to general provisions applicable to counties and municipal corporations so as to ensure that counties and municipal Municipalities are protected from cyber attacks directed at contractors Science and suppliers. Science and technology. Senate Bill 162 by Senator Watson of the 1st and others, a bill to be entitled an act relating to health so as to eliminate certificate of need requirements for all health care facilities. Regulated industries. Senate Bill 163 by Senator Huffstetler of the 52nd and others, a bill to be entitled an act relating to alcoholic beverages so as to provide for regulation of the manufacturer. Regulated industries. 
Senate Bill 164 by Senator Huffstetler of the 52nd and others, a bill to be entitled an act relating to nurses so as to provide for licensure of advanced practice registered nurses to revise definitions to provide for licensure Health and Human Services. Mr. President, that completes the order. Secretary will read the communication from the governor's office. Pr pursuant to the Senate Rules 313, these appointments are referred to Committee on Assignments. Mr. Right, President, the Senate has received the following communication from the governor. Dear Secretary Cook, attached is the list of appointments to various boards, commissions, authorities, and other entities requiring Senate confirmation. This list is submitted pursuant to Senate Rules 3-3.1. If we can provide you with any additional information to assist your office in the confirmation process, please let us know. Sincerely, Brian P. Kemp, Governor. This communication and a list of names for confirmation have been placed on each senator's desk. Mr. President, that completes the order. And those go to the Committee on Assignments. First reading references the House bills, please. House Bill 129 by Representative Hong of the 103rd and others, a bill to be entitled an act relating to public assistance so as to expand temporary assistance for needy families eligibility criteria to pregnant women. To revise definitions to repeal a provision relating to elimination Children of and families. House Bill 139 by Representatives Crow of the 118th and others, a bill to be entitled an act relating to discovery and criminal procedures so as to provide for restrictions of the disclosure of certain personally identifiable information of non-sworn employees of a law enforcement agency who are witnesses Judiciary. in felony. Mr. President, that completes the order. Secretary will read reports of standing committees. Mr. President, the Senate Committee on Agriculture and Consumer Affairs has had under consideration the following legislation and has instructed me to report the same back to the Senate with the following recommendation. Senate Bill 22, due pass by substitute, respectfully submitted Senator Goodman of the 8th District Chairman. The Senate Committee on Economic Development and Tourism has had under consideration the following legislation and has instructed me to report the same back to the Senate with the following recommendation. Senate Bill 112, due pass, respectfully submitted Senator Beach of the 21st District Chairman. The Senate Committee on Judiciary has had under consideration the following legislation and has instructed me to report the same back to the Senate with the following recommendation. Senate Bill 12, do pass by substitute. Senate Bill 13, do pass by substitute. Senate Bill 83, do pass. Respectfully submitted, Senator Strickland of the 17th District Chairman. The Senate Committee on State and Local Government Operations has had under consideration the following legislation and has instructed me to report the same back to the Senate with the following recommendation. Senate Bill 104, do pass. Respectfully submitted, Senator Ginn of the 47th District Chairman. The Senate Committee on State and Local Government Operations General has had under consideration the following legislation and has instructed me to report the same back to the Senate with the following recommendation. Senate Bill 28, do pass. Senate Bill 62, do pass by substitute. Respectfully submitted, Senator Gunn of the 47th District Chairman. The Senate Committee on Veterans, Military, and Homeland Security has had under consideration the following legislation and has instructed me to report the same back to the Senate with the following recommendation. Senate Bill 93, do pass by substitute. Respectfully submitted, Senator Dugan of the 30th District Chairman. That completes the order, Mr. President. Secretary will read bills and resolutions for a second. Senate Bill 59 by Senator Hatchet of the 50th and others, Governor, Office of the Inspector General, established. Senate Resolution 76 by Senator Kirkpatrick of the 32nd and others. Training program, high-risk athletic ath activities for children 14 and under on property owned by the state of Georgia, covering important safety information for prevention and treatment of injuries to our young athletes and courage. Mr. President, that completes the order. It is now time for our morning roll call. Those senators who wish to excuse another. Senator from the 33rd. Thank you, Mr. President. Good morning, y'all. I ask for unanimous consent to excuse the following senators for business outside the Capitol. 35, 38, 15, <laughs> and 26. Without objection, senators from the 35th, 38th, 15th, and 26th will be excused. Are there any other senators? Senator from the 13th. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, you asked me to ask consent to excuse the senator from the 20th for business outside the Capitol. Without objection, senator from the 20th is excused. Are there any other motions to excuse? 
chair here and none. The secretary will call the roll of senators. Please signify your presence by voting yay. The secretary will unlock the machine. It is now time for the morning devotion. All senators, please take your seats and cease all audible conversation. I would ask the doorkeeper to secure the chamber at this time. I'd like to recognize the senator from the 28th to lead us in our Pledge of Allegiance and introduce our chaplain of the day. Thank you, Mr. President. Y'all please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance to our nation's flag. I pledge allegiance. And now our state's flag. I pledge allegiance to the Georgia flag, principles for which it stands, wisdom, justice, moderation, and courage. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Happy Valentine's Day, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce my good friend, Ralph Caldwell. He's been a Baptist minister for 33 years, having served several churches around Heard County and Carroll County over in the west part of our state. Um, most recently serving at Indian Creek Baptist in Bowden for uh, 16 years. Uh, he currently serves as a supply preacher to churches without a pastor and for pastors who are out of town. He's been married to his wife Kim for 35 years and has a son Colton who's actually an attorney there in Heard County. Uh, the Caldwells live in Heard County where uh, Ralph owns Caldwell Farms which is a poultry cattle and row crop operation and it's a it's a family farm. His, his father was there as well. His late father passed away just a couple months ago. was also a dear friend, uh, our former commissioner there in Heard County, Gwen Caldwell. Um, but Gr Ralph was elected uh, Middle Georgia Vice President for the Georgia Farm Bureau in 2021, and he represents 56 counties in that capacity uh, across Georgia from Heard County over to Richmond down to Effingham over to Stewart counties. And so I bring up uh, Ralph Caldwell, great man, great farmer, and great Georgian. Good morning, Senators. It's a, a pleasure and an honor to be here this morning. But I've got to admit, uh, they said it needs to stay down to about five minutes. So that's hard for a Baptist minister to spend five minutes speaking. And, of course, when I was hearing the reading a few minutes ago, I guess that's how you get in five minutes, okay? So, but anyway, it's an honor to be here uh, with you folks today. And uh, you've heard it mentioned a couple times uh, already by the Lieutenant Governor and also Senator Brass that today is Valentine's Day. I hope you uh, haven't forgotten that. But also, uh, today, I want to remind you of another thing, and that is uh, today is Farm Bureau Day at the Capitol. 
And uh, I would like to, I know all of you have already received invitations over for lunch at the freight depot. And so uh, I'd like to encourage you to uh, come and, and have lunch with us over there. So, uh, but this morning as I think about of it being Valentine's Day, and uh, there will be anticipated $26 million spent, billion dollars spent today on Valentine's Day, whether it be for roses or, or cards or candies or uh, taking people out to eat. Now think about the challenge that you folks have of, of adopting a state budget. The state budget I understand for 22-23 is just a little over $30 billion. You run this state for 365 days on just a little bit more than people spend on flowers at Wilt and, and chocolates that melt and cards that gets threw away or put, put somewhere else and lost. Uh, you run an entire state for 365 days. So let me applaud you for that. Um, I was thinking about of, ha of a story that I read one time about a, a young man, a Bible student at a Bible college, and he had uh, decided that he would try to impress his girlfriend's dad. And uh, so he sat down and he wrote a letter out to her dad and shared of his personal testimony, of his relationship with God. And when he finished that letter, he was in a hurry, and of course he was nervous knowing that the father would probably read it over and over and over several times. And he signed it, and he put his life verse down. And that life verse is 1 Samuel 12, 24. And 1 Samuel 12, 24 says, But be sure to fear the Lord and serve him faithfully with all your heart. Consider what great things he has done for you. Well, he was nervous, of course, and he mistakenly, instead of writing down 1 Samuel 12, 24, wrote down 2 Samuel 12 and 24. So the dad, when he finished looking at the letter, he decided he'd look up exactly what 2 Samuel 2, 24 is. And you're probably about like myself, don't know exactly what, what that says. But it says, Then David comforted his wife Bathsheba, and he went to her and lay with her. She gave birth to a son, and they named him Solomon. So, you know, he tried to make an impression on the father, but it wasn't the impression that he had wanted to make. And uh, so uh, that father, I'm sure, never did forget that, and, he, and probably the young man probably never did forget it as well. But I want to bring to a point this morning of First Samuel 12 and 24. It says, be sure to fear the Lord. I think today of, of what an awesome responsibility we have in our lives of that of fearing God. A lot of times we hear the word fear and we think about of something that is, uh, is uh, may a, maybe a horror or something that would be negative towards us. But I think of that word of fearing the Lord is of respecting. As Senator Brass said just a moment ago, my dad passed away earlier in January. And uh, absolutely, as he lay there on his deathbed, there's some things that I did when I was a teenager that I would not want him to know about because he would probably rise up off that bed and whip me. And uh, did I, was I scared of him or feared? No, I had respect for him. I had honor for him because the things in which I'd done had brought, would have brought dishonor to him if he knew about things that I had done when I was younger. And so I want to encourage you today to always remember that this life will soon pass. This life, all of us one day, just as this, this chamber has changed in this past year with elections, uh, our lives will, will change and be gone someday. But make the most of the mark that you have, the time that you have here on this earth. And it says, serve him faithfully with all of your heart. I encourage you today to serve the Lord faithfully. And what, as we look around, is it always amazes me of, of people that question God. And all we've got to do is just look around. As the end of that verse says, consider what great things he has done for you. We have certainly been blessed. And I encourage you to honor God and to honor those that brought you here to in the positions that you're in. I thank you for that. I applaud you for those jobs in which you do and I encourage you and you're in my prayers let's bow our heads in a word of prayer our great and heavenly father we bow our heads before you this morning so thankful for this day in which you have blessed us with God I pray that we will be looking unto you always with respect 
And God, I pray that we will always honor you for the goodness and the greatness that you have done for us within our lives. God, I pray that you would just bless these men and these women and the capacities that they have, dear Lord. They have such an awesome responsibility, Lord. And, and the people back home has confidence in them and voted them to send them here. Lord, I pray give them the wisdom they need for the best for our state. We love you and we thank you for it. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.
We have, uh, we have some special guests with us today. I'm sure uh, everybody has uh, somebody from their local Farm Bureau that is here today because it is Georgia Farm Bureau Day. Secretary, read the resolution, please. Senate Resolution 128 by Senator Goodman of the 8th and others, a resolution recognizing February 14th, 2023 as Georgia Farm Bureau Federation Day at the Capitol and for other purposes. Whereas the Georgia Farm Bureau Federation was formed in 1937 as a voice for ag production, agriculture, and legislative affairs, and whereas from its humble beginnings in Northwest Georgia, the Georgia Farm Bureau Federation has grown to 158 county chapters with a current membership of over 240,000 led by volunteer farmer members. And whereas it is abundantly fitting and proper that the Georgia Farm Bureau Federation and its members be appropriately recognized for their many years of dedicated service to Georgia agriculture. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Senate that the members of this body recognize February 14th, 2023, as Georgia Farm Bureau Federation Day at the State Capitol. Mr. President, that completes the order. It is my pleasure to uh, introduce a senator of the 8th District to uh, recognize our special guest, but I want to take a moment just to uh, point out that our uh, head president of Farm Bureau, Tom McCall, is a former legislator. He served in the House for many, many years and chaired the Agricultural Committee over there in the House and was always a good friend and a good partner with the agricultural community here in the state of Georgia, and he's doing a great job with the Georgia Farm Bureau. So. I uh, want to thank them for what they do uh, for our number one industry in the state, which is agriculture. And, uh, and uh, if you have an opportunity, please uh, go join the uh, members from all over the state. We'll be at the depot today for lunch. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce the senator from the 8th. Well, it's just I'm, I'm honored to be able to uh, stand here today uh, with Tom McCall. Uh, Tom, when I qualified, uh, I've got a picture of my son and I in his office. He was still chairman of the House Ag Committee at the time, and that's a picture that I uh, really cherish. And, you know, when I graduated from college, I started out with uh, Farm Bureau Young Farmers and then was president of our local uh, county Farm Bureau and still serve on the board today, although I hate to say I miss most of the meetings because I'm in, in Atlanta during this time of year. But, uh, you know, I really appreciate Farm Bureau and what they what they do for our state and what they do for the farm community and the advocacy that they do on, be on behalf of rural Georgia. And uh, I'm just thankful to have my good friend Tom McCall here today. Mr. Mr. President, would you like to come up and say a few words? There you go. And this is your resolution that well, they just you. read. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, I see a lot of familiar faces out there, and I know there's a lot of new people. So uh, we appreciate what Chairman Goodman did for us, letting us come talk to you a minute. Today is Farm Bureau Day at the Capitol. We have over 700 people here, and there's somebody from y'all's district, and we want you to come and eat dinner down at the depot if you have a chance. Uh, we are your resource for any kind of ag issues, and uh, we appreciate uh, what y'all do for us. I will tell you this, it, when y'all start discussing some of this stuff, be real careful to protect Gate and Coover. Without Gate and Coover, I don't know if the largest industry in this state could survive. So uh, I want y'all to be mindful of that. Uh, real quick, I want to introduce three people up here. Farm Bureau is divided into regions, north, middle, and south. Uh, my North Georgia Vice President, Mr. Bernard Sims from up in Ringo. Daniel Johnson's a South Georgia Vice President from down in Pierce County, and y'all heard the Baptist preacher this morning who is a Middle Georgia Vice President from over in Heard County, and we appreciate y'all. We have about 250,000 member families and across the state, and I tell folks that understand how to count votes, when you say 250,000 member families, that's about a half a million votes. So. Uh, we hope we can help y'all. We appreciate what you do for ag, and we appreciate what you do for Farm Bureau. Again, please come down to the depot and eat dinner with us. You are welcome, and there is somebody here from your district, I can promise you. Thank y'all very much.
Are there any unanimous consents? Does any senator wish to rise on a point of personal privilege? Senator from the ninth. Hey members, I bring greetings today from the great Gwinnett County. Y'all know how I feel about Gwinnett County. Um, and right now, uh, members, it is my pleasure to welcome what makes us even greater, our Gwinnett um, Chamber. They're in the Capitol today, and they're here for Gwinnett Chamber Loves Georgia Day. Um, and we have several members from the Chamber with us today. That includes uh, Paul O, Dean Collins, from Ray Marcel, Trey Ragsdale, uh, Dion Tucker, Andrea Cyber, Lisa Winton, and Brian Ginn. If y'all would stand up for me, let's welcome the, you guys to our chamber today. And I just want to highlight the privilege re resolution that we have for them, SR 129. I'm not going to go through the whole resolution, the whereas and the what's a, what, a, what as, but just want to make a, highlight a few points. Um, the chamber was established in 1947, and the Gwinnett Chamber recently celebrated its 75th anniversary. It currently serves over 2,000 members and representing over 2,200 businesses, plus over 10,000 sole proprietors in Gwinnett County. Gwinnett is also home to nearly 600 international businesses. As of November 17, 2022, the Gwinnett Chamber of Commerce earns a five-star accreditation from the U.S. Chambers of Commerce, the highest designation achievable in the chamber history nationwide. With only 201 accredited chambers with any designation, the Gwinnett Chamber is now on, on the top 1% of accredited chambers nationwide. So it is my pleasure and I would like to recognize this day, February 14th, 2023, as Gwinnett Chamber Loves Georgia Day. Thank you all for coming. I yield the well. Thank you, Senator. And y'all had a wonderful event the other night the, for the Chamber uh, Gala, I guess, that I was able to attend. Good turnout, good group of people. So thank you for that, Senator. Uh, Senator I'd like to uh, recognize uh, my, our doctor of the day, and I'd like to call on the Senator from the 42nd to introduce him. Thank you, Mr. President. Good morning, colleagues. Happy Valentine's Day. It is my distinct honor to bring before you the doctor of the day. Dr. Lawrence L. Sanders, Jr., who has a uh, MD and an MBA. Dr. Sanders serves as the Senior Vice President for Utilization and Care Management at Grady Health System. Dr. Sanders believes that good health is the result of individuals, groups, organizations, neighborhoods, and communities working together to create the conditions in every neighborhood and community to foster good health. As a leader, he, tries to, he strives to align clinical, financial, and administrative imperatives. His background is in epidemiology, management, and organizational effectiveness, and his clinical practice equips him to serve as a health service delivery subject matter expert and to communicate, communicate across clinical, financial, and administrative sectors. Uh, he is a resident of Decatur, Georgia, downtown Decatur. Please join me in welcoming and thanking Dr. Lawrence L. Sanders, Jr. Well, good morning. I think you know my name is Lawrence Sanders, and first I want to say thank you for the work you do for the people of Georgia every day in making resources available to keep our state strong. Also, I'm, I'm particularly thought are called by your effort to keep Georgia as a strong economic state with a good employment industry. And because I spend my day at Grady Hospital every day caring for people, many people who otherwise would not get health care, I understand 
how important health is to your vision for a strong Georgia. It is about all of us working together to create the conditions, to make the resources available, to assure that every person in Georgia has an opportunity for the best health they can have. Because it is with that health that they can take advantage of the economic opportunities you create. At Grady, I serve as part of what we call the health care safety net, meaning we care for people who otherwise don't get care. And so we depend on you for resources to make that work. Because at Grady, we care for vulnerable people every day. But Grady serves all of us in vulnerable times. So thank you very much, and thank you for what we do. And let's continue to work, work together to keep Georgia healthy. Thank you. Senator from 33rd. Thank you, Mr. President, <clears throat> my fellow senators, colleagues, friends, and y'all. Uh, today is another Black History moment, and I'd like to highlight one of our featured black history figures, which is the senator from the 12th, otherwise known as Senator Freddie Paul Sims. A Democrat from Dawson was elected to the state Senate in 2008 to represent the 12th sen senatorial district. Senator Sims serves as the Secretary of the Education and Youth Committee, Vice Chair of Interstate Corporation, and is a member of the Agriculture Consumer Affairs, Appropriation, Natural Resources, and Environmental Committees. Although this is her second legislative role after serving in the Georgia House, her community, civic, and professional involvement has been extensive. Senator Sims has been an active member of the Qantas International, the Fort Valley State University Foundation Board, a deputy registrar for the Doherty County, Children in Poverty, and several other organizations. Her involvement in such organization has made her the recipient of several awards and certificates. In 2004, she was the Outstanding Financial Contributions to the Capital Campaign Award for Fort Valley State University. And in 2008, she was the Outstanding Legislator of the Year for the Technical and Adult Education. Senator, the Senator from the 12th, Senator Sims, decided to get into politics because of her desire to serve the public more specifically, to provide a voice for those citizens who do not seem to have one. Sims is a retired middle school principal, and I taught in middle school, you have to be tough to be a principal of a middle school. And she has a doctor of educational leadership. Dr. Sims is a devout Baptist and is married to Norman Sims. The couple also have three daughters. When it comes to problem solving, I always rely on Senator Sims to provide me some of her wisdom. She's always good at providing suggestions, and then as usual, she ends up telling me what to do. The lady knows what she wants, and she knows how to get it. A civil rights pioneer from Southwest Georgia and Senator from the 12th District, that's our Black History Moment. Thank you. I yield, I yield well, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Senator from the 50th, would you like to rise on point of personal privilege? Thank you, Mr. President. <clears throat> I rise today with a proclamation from the governor um, naming this week, February 13th through the 17th, as Senior Week, uh, whereas in 1977 the state of Georgia authorized the establishment of the Georgia Council of Aging to serve as trusted advisors to the state's leadership regarding areas of concern being faced by Georgia's elderly citizen. 
citizens, and whereas the Coalition of Advocates for Georgia's Elderly, or COAGE, was established by the Council to provide a means through which members of the aging network could collaborate and identify the most pressing issues facing seniors all across our state, and whereas Georgia's 1.5 million citizens, 65 and older, represent 14.7 percent of the state's population and is the fastest growing segment of the population, and whereas these citizens provide invaluable resources and contributions to the overall position Georgia holds as one of the best places to live, and whereas in recognition of the advocacy efforts of its members, COAGE invites citizens to participate in events each year during a designated week designed to highlight the partnerships and support provided by the leadership of this state and to provide members of the aging community the opportunity to come together to celebrate and recognize the contributions of Georgia's seniors. So this week is Senior Week. I want to say happy Senior Week to all the seniors and, and thank you to the governor for this proclamation. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Senator from the 35th, would you like to speak from your desk there? Uh-huh. Thank you, Mr. President. Hello and good morning to all. I'm excited to share with all of you this morning a black history moment as we bring in the 14th day of Black History Month. Today I wanted to start by sharing a few lines from one of my favorite poets, Maya Angelou. Out of the huts of history shame I rise, up from a past that's rooted in pain, I rise. I'm a black ocean, leaping and wide, welling and swelling, I bear with the tide. Leaving behind nights of terror and fear, I rise into a daybreak that's wondrously clear, I rise. Bringing the gifts that my ancestors gave, I am the dream and the hope of a slave. I rise, I rise, I rise. Maya Angelou was a civil rights activist and trailblazer in the art of poetry and writing in America, receiving international recognition of her 36 published books. More than 30 of them are best-selling titles. As a young child, Maya experienced physical and emotional and sexual trauma that left her almost completely mute for several years. Such as her work is the result of the difficult early life. Struggling to make a life for herself, Angelou worked as a cocktail waitress, cook, dancer, and even through all of this, she still continued to pursue her passion for writing as she put in long hours in each of these positions. Angelou was also an actress, director, producer of plays, movies, and public television programs. Maya Angelou is an example to every black woman with a passion, and I'm honored to share part of her story with you today. So she received a Pulitzer uh, Prize Tony Award, three Grammys during her career, and the list goes on. Not only is she an inspiration to me personally, but her art shaped black culture for generations to come. Her other poem, Pretty Women Wonder, Where Are My Secret Lies? I'm not cute or built to suit a fashion model size. But when I start to tell them, they think I'm telling lies. I say it's in the reach of my arms the span of my hips, the stride of my step, and the curl of my lips. I'm a woman, phenomenally, phenomenal woman, that's me. And she closed by saying, now you understand why my head's not bowed. I don't shout or jump about or have to talk real loud. When you see me passing, it ought to make you proud. I say, it's in the click of my heels, the bend of my hair, the palm of my hands, and the need of my care, because I'm a woman, phenomenally, phenomenal woman, that's me. So I applaud all the phenomenal women of Georgia today, uh, speaking of Maya Angelou, and happy Valentine's Day to all, 
Happy Black History Month. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the will. Thank you, Senator. Senator from the 30th, which, which rise on point of personal privilege. Thank you, Mr. President. Happy Valentine's to everybody here. I know this is exactly where y'all want to be on Valentine's Day. I do have uh, Mrs. Carmen Dell here with us with the Carrollton High School FCC LA Club. Now, my generation takes great pride in talking poorly about this younger generation that they don't do anything for anybody but themselves, but that's not what the FCC LA is. The FCC LA is all about paying it forward, contributing and, and providing service to their communities and looking to become the leaders of the future, the exact kind of people that we look for as our next generations of leaders. So if the FCC LA from Carrollton, if y'all would stand up, please. Y'all join me in welcoming them to the Capitol. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the well. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Senator from the 44th. Good morning, thank you, Mr. President. Today I rise to give tribute to a friend, Mrs. Bernella Bunny Hayes Jackson Ransom, the first African-American first lady of the city of Atlanta. In 1973, when Maynard Jackson became the first black mayor of the city of Atlanta and in a major southern city, Bunny became the first black first lady. Bunny was born in Lewisburg, North Carolina, to two educators, and her father was also a former ba professional baseball player in the Negro Leagues. She graduated magna cum laude from North Carolina's college and received her master's from HBCU, North Carolina Central University in business and economics, and worked at Bennett College, one of two all-women historically black colleges. She moved to Atlanta worked at Economic Opportunity Atlanta and married Maynard Holbrook Jackson. She was the mother of four children, three daughters and one son. As first lady, she boosted the arts and was responsible for the Avon Ailey Dance Theater return to Atlanta. She also convinced the High Museum to hang an exhibit by Ernie Barnes in the Galleria of Symphony Hall. Exhibitors Exhibitions by Bernie Andrews and Roma Bearden followed. In 1975, she founded First Class, a public relations and marketing firm, and served as the president and CEO until she retired in 2002. As founder and president of Atlanta Artist Management, she managed the recording careers of acts such as Cameo, Larry Blackman, Brick, and the SOS Band. Bunny loved the city of Atlanta and was a member and leader in some of the city's leading social and cultural organizations, including Delta Sigma Theta, Jack and Jill, the Lynx, the National Coalition of 100 Black Women. Listed as Outstanding Young Women in America in 1970, Who's Who in American Women, Who's Who in Georgia, and in Dollars and Cents Magazine, and also Atlanta's Top 100 Women of Influence. She was the author of two books, Getting the Word Out, How to Market Your Ministry, and Memoirs of a Life Well Lived, the first First Lady. I join other Georgians to remember her as a dedicated community and business leader, generous humanitarian, and an inspiration to the many people whose lives she touched. As the first African-American First Lady of the city of Atlanta, she represented the city well. Her beautiful celebration of life was yesterday at the historic Ebenezer Baptist Church, where many people across this nation gave tribute to her. 
Mr. President, I'm not sure if we did a moment of silence last week. If not, I would just ask for a moment of silence. Amen. Thank you very much. I yield the well. Senator, I apologize for that. I um, apologize for that. I missed that. Senator from the 5th. Thank you, Mr. President. I wasn't planning to speak here today, but uh, this is my first time in the world since we came back. It's an honor to serve with you all. And every day during the session, I wake up to be here. It's not only privilege, it's a pleasure to serve. I guess recently you probably noticed, you know, a lot of time been excused over here. You probably don't see me in the morning. Most of, most of the day, it's not being everything, I mean, it's not everything going well with me. Last couple of months, I've been sick. So what inspired me, what hearing from my colleagues, from the Senator from the uh, Sixth, and some of the colleagues, some of the personal issue, I just want to mention something that last couple of months has been rough for me. Because I had a COVID, just my personal story, I had a COVID this summer. And right after that, I missed my doctor's appointment. And I said, be okay. I didn't go check with my doctors. And I have a doctors wanted to see me for my constituency, wanted to meet in my office. I said, come on over. So I made that appointment. She came in. I'm at CEO of Booth 301. And I talked to her. I said, you know what, doctors? After I got the meeting done, I said, what kind of doctors you are? And she said, well, I'm an internist. I do the general practice. I said, you know what? I'm not feeling good. I, need to, I needed to probably go check in doctors because I had a COVID and I, recently I've not been feeling really good. And she said, okay, I'm gonna go give you a number. I'm gonna let my nurses know, I'm gonna give you a call. As soon as I can see you, it's fine. The next morning, I got a call from the nurse's office and the doctor told me, uh, she, uh, the person told me, the doctor can see you later on today. Can you stop by? I said, definitely, because I'm not feeling good. So I went there got my some blood work and waited half an hour and went back there and said, something's fishy, it's not looking too good. So she gave me some prescriptions and I came back home and I got a call at nine o'clock in the morning and I said, you need to come back, we need to do additional checks. And after doing all these additional checks, she told me, you had a heart failure. You had a heart failure not once, twice. We need to immediately get you to a cardiologist. The, she made some appointment. I went to see the cardiologist and say, you're fine. I said, well, I'm okay. And you know what? Your heart is functioning only 35%. I said, I don't know. I know I don't feel good. Then he found out all, all this test and everything else. I had a 90% blockage on my heart. They said, we might have to do heart transplant. We don't not, we're not sure. Looks like you may look good. Everything's fine, but internally it's not fine. So anyway, long story short, I'm glad the doctors came, to, one of the doctors came to see me at the Capitol and I had all these checkups done. I don't think I haven't been to doctors 10 times the last 20 years. I feel normally good and healthy. I was taking one blood pressure medicine last few years because my pressure was a little high. Now I take nine different medicine. Some with food, some are not food. So my life has changed a little bit. So I'm taking, trying to take my, some rest, do whatever I can, and I feel a little better today because it's Valentine's Day. My wife and my daughter is with me today. I'm supposed to be in here somewhere in these chambers. I feel a little, a little better. That's why I'm, I came here to speak to you all that's one of the reasons you probably don't see me in the morning or come and speak to you all. I'm asking for you to pray for me 
and I know I'm going to get well. I'm getting enough rest, whatever I need to do, but I want you to know this is what I'm going through. But I'm doing fine. Thank you, thank you, thank you for listening to me. Thank you, Mr. President. I appreciate you. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Senator. Good to have you back here today. So, Senator from the 43rd, you wish to rise on a point of personal privilege. Thank you, Mr. President. Good morning, colleagues. Today I rise to acknowledge um, celebration of Founders Day for the African Methodist Episcopal Church, the first black church on the face of this planet who has showed other churches how to be the church, how to have church, and how to um, have a method. Our founder, Richard Allen, founded the AME Church 1816 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And our bishop is here. I don't know if we still have any AMEs in the gallery, but if you are, would you please stand? Yay! And welcome to your state capitol as we celebrate our Founders Day this month. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the world. You have before you a consent calendar of privileged resolutions. Does any senator wish to remove a resolution from the consent calendar? Is there objection to the adoption of the resolution of the consent calendar? Chair hears none, and the resolution of the consent calendar is adopted. Are there any motions to withdraw and commit? Hear no motions. Hmm. You have before you your consent calendar of local bills. Mr. Secretary, have any objections been filed to any of the bills of the, on the local consent calendar? Mr. President, no objections have been filed. Is there objection to agreeing to the report of the committee on state and local government operations which is favorable to the passage of the bills on the local consent calendar chair hears none and the report of the committee is agreed to the question is question is on the passage of the bills of local consent calendars all those in favor vote yay opposed nay secretary will unlock the machine On the passage of the bill, the yeas are 50, nays are zero. This bill on the local consent calendar have received the requisite constitutional majority and therefore is passed. All right, we're on, our, on the way to the rules calendar here. So SB 69, secretary will read the caption.
Senate Bill 69 by Senator Watson of the First and others, a bill to be entitled an act to amend Chapter 3 of Title 50 of the Official Code of Georgia Annotated, relating to state flag, seal, and other symbols so as to provide for placement of a monument in honor of the Honorable Clarence Thomas within the Capitol building or grounds. The Senate Committee on Rules recommends that this bill do pass. Respectfully submitted, Senator Brass, Chairman. Senator Parent of the 42nd and others offers the following amendment. Amend SB 69 by replacing a monument with monuments on line two, by inserting and the Honorable John Lewis after Thomas on line three, by replacing a monument with monuments on line 12, by inserting and the Honorable John Lewis after Thomas on line 12, by replacing monument with monuments on lines 13, 22, 23, and 27. Mr. President, that completes the order. Recognize the Senator from the first to speak to the measure. Thank you, Mr. President. I rise today to uh, discuss Senate Bill 69. Uh, as a Senator from the first, I live literally down the creek, or really what we call Moon River, uh, where I live on Isle of Hope, from Pinpoint. It's about two miles down Moon River, uh, and it is my area, it's the area that I represent. I represent uh, about half of Chatham County, all of Liberty, and all of Bryan. And uh, I'm rising today because I'm proud uh, to present this legislation allowing a statue honoring United States Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas to be placed on the state capitol. As we all know, all politics is local, and I will tell you I've, I've known Justice Clarence Thomas's mother uh, for over 30 years. Uh, first meeting her when my wife had surgery uh, at one of the local hospitals, and she was the liaison. Uh, for the patients and the physicians and staff and so forth. Wonderful person, uh, worked in that job until she was in her 90s and uh, still thriving and living in Pinpoint, Georgia, uh, which is, as I said, just down the creek. Justice Thomas was born there. His father left the family when he was two, and a house fire later left Thomas, his mother, and siblings homeless. Clarence Thomas lived with his maternal grandparents in Savannah. When they moved, his grandfather taught him the value of hard work and getting a good education. Despite the challenging circumstances he was born into, Clarence Thomas went on to achieve greatness. He was the first of his family to attend college. And after a brief study at seminary, he graduated cum laude from Holy Cross, Holy Cross in 1971. Received his JD or Juris Doctor from Yale in 1974. In 1981, Clarence Thomas joined President Ronald Reagan's administration as Assistant Secretary for Civil Rights in the Department of Education before chairing the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. In 1989, Clarence Thomas was nominated by President George Bush for a seat on the United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia. With the retirement of Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall, the first African American on the court, Thomas was nominated as his replacement. After a confirmation hearing before the Senate Judiciary Committee, marred by the worst type of political gamesmanship, Judge Thomas persevered and was confirmed by a bipartisan vote of the Democrat-controlled Senate. Justice Thomas now served with a distinction on the highest court in the land for over 30 years. Clarence Thomas lived a life marked by tremendous achievement or has lived a life marked by tremendous achievement, don't put, want to put him in his grave yet, uh, and worth commemorating. This native son of Georgia deserves a place of honor and recognition on our capital grounds, a place where future generations of Georgians can learn valuable lessons from his legacy and gain inspiration in the belief that their lofty dreams are attainable too in America, regardless of the circumstances in which they are born.
This Senate bill is straightforward. It calls for a monument honoring Justice Thomas to be designed, procured, and placed on the Capitol, uh, placed by the Capitol Art Standards Commission, subject to approval by committee, a monument committee composed of members of the General Assembly. Funding will come from private sources with no public funds to be expended. With that, I ask for your favorable consideration, and I'm happy to yield for questions. You do, you do have some questions, Senator. Thanks. Uh, Senator from the 10th. Thank you, Mr. President. Will the Senator yield? Yes, I will, to my Senator, Senator from the 10th. I notice on the back over on line 16, you talk about the members that would serve on your uh, committee. Do yes, you, sir. Do you have any objection to adding two members from the Georgia Legislative Black Caucus to serve on the committee as well? Well, I mean, this is the usual standard for doing this, so uh, this is sort of the cookie cutter relating to that, so yes, I would. Senator, further you? Yes. Senator, um, the reason why I ask that question is because this is a person of color, and I believe that ensuring that we have uh, the people of color's voice heard on the committee would be instrumental. And I would hope that uh, if you couldn't agree to at least two members of the GLBC, then you would commit to at least two members from the Democratic Caucus. Uh, Senator from the 10th, uh, these will be uh, appointed by the Speaker of the House, Lieutenant Governor, uh, and one from the Governor. It does not preclude anyone from, uh, from any of them nominating a person of color. Senator, further yield? Yes, sir. Senator, you would agree that Justice Thomas is a controversial figure in the African American community? Wouldn't you agree with that? Uh, I'm sure you speak with passion. Uh, I don't see it that way, but I understand that. Senator Further, you? Yes. Being a person of color, can you understand that I have issues with some of the I, rulings, not the man, but particularly some of his positions that he's taken on issues that are important to those of us of color? I certainly respect your opinion. Senator Further, you? Yes. Senator, do you understand the issues that women may have with some of the positions that uh, Justice Thomas has taken as well. I understand it. I don't necessarily agree with it, but I understand it. Yes, certainly. Respect your opinion. And Senator, further years, I hate to go through all the litany of those who may your, align themselves against your, it. Your, your decision on that one, Senator. But you do understand some of the sensitivities I, that we I have. understand, yes. Thank don't you, necessarily Senator. agree with it, but I certainly understand your position. Thank you, Senator. Senator from the 43rd, you wish to ask a question? Thank you, Mr. President. Does the gentleman yield? Yes. Uh, you stated that you um, represent Pinpoint, Georgia? I do. Uh, do you further yield? I, I'm sorry, I didn't quite understand that. Uh, th that's the question. You answered it. Do you further yield? Oh, yes, yes. I'm sorry. Is there a place in Pinpoint, Georgia for this statue? Is there, is there a place? Is there a location in Pinpoint, Georgia where this statue can be placed? Um, I, I don't know where that question's coming from. I, I certainly, uh, that's not having to do with this bill, but uh, is there a place if you wanted to have a statue made and put in Pinpoint, Georgia, or if I did, I'm sure there's, there may be an area for that. I really haven't researched that. Okay. Do you further yield? Yes. May I suggest that the study committee look for a location in Pinpoint since this is the home place of uh, uh, Justice Thomas? You may suggest that. That's not what this law does, but I, I appreciate your thoughts. Senator from 31st. Good morning, Senator. Do you yield? Yes, I do. Um, one question I have is, is it not true that the Capital Arts Standard Commission, isn't it, um, the history of it is typically bipartisan and representative of everybody in the General Assembly? Is that not true? Thank you for that clarification and that, yes, that is true. Is it not true that the Capital Arts Standard Commission in the past 
and, for, and past leaders of this state um, have placed, uh, whether you ver view them as conservative, liberal, Republican, Democrat, even a former president of the United States on this Capitol grounds? Absolutely, that is true. Is it not true that the former president of the United States, the, who is a former great governor of this state, um, there's uh, citizens and probably members of this body who take issue with his policies back when he was governor and even president of, this, of these United States, um, but we respect that history in this body? Yes, irregardless of race, that is absolutely true. Thank you, Senator. Are you? You have no further questions. Senator. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. I would appreciate your favorable consideration. Senator from the 9th, would you like to speak to the measure? Your light's on. Thank you, Mr. President. I rise today to speak uh, against this bill. While I do appreciate the personal connection and the relationship that the senator from the first has with Justice Thomas, I just, my reality and the reality of many that I represent and the reality of people of color is very different. And while my words at our last hearing over this bill may have been misconstrued, I would like to clarify that the comments made were solely intended to highlight my objection, objections and explain his controversy and how his actions may div be divisive and explain how his rulings have justifiably earned strong disdain among most people of color, color and have impacted not only Georgia but women nationwide. As I mentioned during my last speech, Justice Thomas' tenure has not ended and his career legacy is still being established. As a reminder, Justice Thomas succeeded a judicial giant, Chief Justice Thurgood Marshall, a fierce litigator for civil rights, who when nominated Southern senators on the panel gave their majority approval in the full Senate. And they reported, and I quote, nominee Marshall demonstrated those qualities, those qualities we admire in members of our highest judicial tribunal, along with a balanced approach to controversial and complicated national problems. In contrast, Justice Thomas has indeed lived up to some of the cautions that I presented in my first speech by rolling back judicial president in the pursuit of political objectives, despite having assured the, pub, assured the public in Congress on multiple occasions that he would adhere to, adhere to and respect precedent. Additionally, his wife is directly implicated in not only participating in the insurrection on January 6, 2021, and I want to remind everyone how shameful and embarrassing it was to have insurrectionists storm our Capitol. Go back and look at that video sometime. Law enforcement officers were killed and abused. It is a stain on the United States for that to have ever happened. And his wife also actively encouraged this coup of violence in an attempt to stop a peaceful transfer of power for the first time in our country's history. She's made known efforts to ensure that the president stay in power despite the clear victory in a democratic election of his opponent. I would like to add that election was deemed by multiple independent sources to be the most secure in the nation's history. Our own Secretary of State, Brad Raffensperger, and Governor Kemp were pressured by Mrs. Thomas Associates to overturn a free and fair election. Investigations are still ongoing. This is not the time to consider establishing a, a permanent monument to Justice Thomas, and we should take a pause here, members. This is not the type of shame we want to enshrine on Capitol grounds. At minimum, this bill should be tabled until such time that Judge uh, Justice Thomas and his wife are cleared of collaboration in this dark chapter in our history. The great state of Georgia made history by exhibiting leadership that showed it would not be cowed by powerful men and women seeking to overturn elections. 
We should not turn that hard-worn victory on his head by enshrining participants and those aligned with participants that are part of this shameful moment in the history on our grounds. Given the controversial nature and sensitivity of Justice Thomas and his tenure that has not yet ended, why are we even voting on this bill? We have so many other important issues to address in this state. So I'm asking this body to vote, mono, vote no, and if I don't have any questions, I yield. That's it. Senator from the 31st, we'd like to. Hey, Mr. President, the Senator yield? Yes. Um, this bill in front of us today, does it um, state anywhere that we're debating Virginia Thomas? It does not, but Senator, no one is separated from their spouse. Everyone in their home has values in their home. I know I do. I share values with my husband as you do with your husband and family. They are not separated. I find that very hard to believe. Well, Senator, I'm, I'm married to my wife, Jennifer. Um, <laughs> my next question is, um, has Clarence Thomas been charged or accused of any crimes? Allegedly. Allegedly. Not a crime, but a allegedly. Has that been, uh, Senator, has that been held, upheld in a court of law? Has it, he been formally indicted? Has, it has not the jury rhetoric any verdict against uh, Justice told, Clarence Thomas? It hasn't been disputed either. Okay, so Clarence Thomas. It hasn't been fully cleared or disputed. So, Senator, is, is, if I ask a follow-up question, is Senator Thomas been uh, investigated by law enforcement with any sort of recommendation of indictment or any sort of action against him? Yes. There's no recommendation, no. He was cleared, but okay, so it can still Justice be. Justice Thomas was cleared. It was, he was cleared, but it is still disputed. Disputed, mm -hmm. okay. So not a matter of fact. We saw the hearings. We saw the testimony of Anita Hill. I believe the woman, and many do. So, Senator, last question is, um, just to be clear, so in, in the case of Anita Hill and the alleged activities that you're bringing here today regarding January 6th, Clarence Thomas has not been indicted, mentioned, or anything and related to doing any wrongdoing in, in, with the United States government or anything. Is that not correct? The sen Clar uh, Justice Thomas has not been indicted in the Anita Hill incident, nor have we fully cleared him of his wife or his participation, participation possibly in the insurrection. That has not been cleared. All right, thank or you, Senator. Thank you. Senator from the 12th, would you like to rise for a question? Thank you, Mr. President. Father Senator Noel, is it not true that the 39th President of these United States from Plains, Georgia is my most famous famous and valued constituent. The senator knows of what she speaks. Thank you. Isn't it also true that there is absolutely no, none, zero similarities of integrity and moral values or behavior between these two men? The senator, woman, senator knows what she speaks. Thank you. You have no further questions, Senator? I yield the will. We have an amendment uh, to this bill, and uh, would the Senator from the 42nd like to speak to your amendment? Thank you, Mr. Pres President. I rise um, with an amendment that would simply add um, a statue of another um, famous and very consequential black Georgian to the bill, that of uh, the Honorable John Lewis. Everyone knows John Lewis. I don't need to extol him for too many minutes, but I do want to read a few things about 
Congressman Lewis. The son of Alabama sharecroppers, Representative John Lewis of Georgia, dedicated his life to advancing the cause of freedom and equality in America. As a leader of the civil rights movement of the 1960s, Lewis challenged Jim Crow segregation and oppression across the South through nonviolent protest. Lewis put his own physical safety on the line many times, and his bold, peaceful stands against discrimination were often met with violence. In 1965, Alabama state troopers in the town of Selma attacked Lewis and other demonstrators with clubs and tear gas during a march for voting rights. Images of the assault were broadcast around the country and directly contributed to the passage of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Two decades later, in 1986, Lewis was elected to the U.S. House of Representatives from an Atlanta district, part of a new generation of black lawmakers from the South, made possible directly by Lewis's tireless work to expand access to the ballot for previously disenfranchised black Americans and black Georgians. During his more than three decades in Congress, Lewis was a formidable legislator who exerted moral and political leadership within the Democratic Party and who never forgot his activist roots. The appalling brutality against peaceful demonstrators, including John Lewis and Selma, served, for the, served as the catalyst for congressional action on voting rights. You have no question, Senator. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, and actually, I had one more little bit to add, if that's oh, okay, I Mr. President. I, I know, I was, I was trying to scroll sorry. down. <laughs> apologies, apologies. Lewis's celebrated record of activism gave him a prominent place on Capitol Hill from the very beginning of his House career. Reporters sought his perspective on every important bill, controversy, or maneuver in Congress. His public comments carried significant weight within the Democratic caucus and often garnered praise from Republicans. For many on Capitol Hill, Lewis was the very embodiment of the conscience of Congress. And finally, Mr. President, I just want to add that um, since Congressman Lewis is unfortunately no longer with us, I think now is, is really an excellent time to consider um, post-hominously post um, erecting a statue to Congressman Lewis on Capitol grounds. And yes, I'm, I'm now, um, will be delighted to answer any questions, and if there are none, yield the ball. I apologize for that, Senator. I have uh, people yes, in, I understand. In my ear, I understand. Absolutely. You do have one question here. Yes, you do have yes, a yes, Senator from 51st. Thank you. Good morning. Will the Senator yield? Of course. Senator, I believe last year we had this same bill on the floor of the Senate, and the, the minority party voted against it unanimously. Is that correct? I don't recall the breakdown of the vote, but I'll speak for myself in saying that I voted against it, yes. And I imagine, based on the testimony we've heard already this morning, a lot of your minority party members are going to vote against this bill for clarity. Uh, Senator, I, I actually don't, I, I, I don't know how everyone intends to vote on the bill. Thank you. Um, my question is, given the significance of Congressman Lewis's life and his service to our country, why haven't you introduced a separate bill to well, do Well, I have a thing? lot of different things, like all of us do, that we are all working on every day. And you know how it is down here with a tight session and lots of different committees and lots of important topics. Um, we have to sort of select what we're putting, putting forth, and, and not everything gets done every single day that we might all want to introduce. So now I saw a great opportunity to put this forward. Do you continue to yield? Sure. So don't you think with his level of service to our country, he would deserve a separate bill to honor him and his life in his service to our state? Well, this is a great bill that's before us right now, and it would seem if we did want to work on a statue for John Lewis, now would be an opportune time. Well, great. So I take it if we adopt your amendment, you're going to vote for the bill. I can only speak for myself, Senator. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Senator from the 55th. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Yield. Yes, ma'am, I yield. Senator, is it not true that the comments that were made last year and this morning by one of our senators is not the opinion of each senator? 
every member <clears throat> that is up here is speaking and they're expressing their viewpoints. And that's, and that's a wonderful thing about dialogue and debate within this chamber and among the 56 of us, something that, that I welcome and think is very important. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Madam Leader. You have no further questions, Senator. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the well. Senator from the 7th, would you like to speak to the measure? Thank you, Mr. President. I rise today in opposition to Senate Bill 69. For too long, the Georgia State Capitol has been home to statues and paintings of those who stood against our values and our democracy. And to me, these monuments are an affront to all of those who have fought and died for this country. And that is why in my own county, I helped lead the movement to remove the last Confederate monument in Gwinnett. But here at the Georgia State Capitol, statues and monuments have stood for decades some mere steps from this chamber, monuments whose memories of insurrection and national betrayal were or continue to be honored alongside those who gave the last full measure of devotion to preserve America and protect our democratic society. Let me remind you of some of the names pulled from the Georgia archives of those honored here who fought to secede from this nation and overthrow our democracy. Alexander H. Stevens, Vice President of the Confederacy. Howell Cobb, General in Confederate Army, U.S. Representative, Speaker of the U.S. House, Governor, Secretary of the Treasury, one of the founders of the Confederacy. John Brown Gordon, Confederate General, Senator, and Governor from Georgia. Joseph Emerson Brown, Georgia Governor and Senator, Chief Justice of the Georgia Supreme Court, led Georgia into the Confederacy. William Ambrose White, Lieutenant in the Confederate Army, Georgia State Comptroller. Benjamin Harvey Hall, United States and Confederate Senator, U.S. Representative from Georgia. Logan Edwin Bleckley, Confederate Soldier, Chief Justice of the Georgia Supreme Court. James S. Boynton, Private in the Confederate Army, Governor of Georgia. Alan D. Candler, Colonel in the Confederate Army, Governor, Secretary of the State, U.S. Representative, State Senator and State Rep. Alfred H. Quilcott, Confederate, General, Governor, Senator and U.S. Representative. George W. Crawford, President of the Georgia Secession Convention, U.S. Representative, Governor, Secretary of War, State Attorney General. Charles Frederick Crisp, Lieutenant in the Confederate Army. Clement A. Evans, General of the Confederate Army. Herschel Johnson, Confederate, State Senator, Governor of Georgia, U.S. Senator. John McIntosh Kell, Commander in the Confederate States Navy. Sidney Lanier, Private in the Confederate States Army. Thomas G. Lawson, Georgia Representative, U.S. Representative, two years in the Confederate Army. Robert E. Lee, General of the Confederate Army. Henry Dickerson McDaniel, Major in the Confederate Army, Delegate to the Georgia, Georgia Secession Co Convention. James Milton Smith, Confederate Colonel, Governor, Speaker of Georgia House, and Robert Toombs, Confederate General. 21 names, 21 Confederates who betrayed our country have been honored at the state capitol. And I believe today, if we choose to pass this bill and honor associate Justice Clarence Thomas, in this way, we may be making that mistake once more. Serious questions remain about the events of January 6th and the role of Associate Justice Thomas's wife, Ginny Thomas. What Justice Thomas knew, what his role may or may not have been, remains unknown by this body and by the public. What we do know, however, is that there was contact between Justice Thomas's wife and organizers of the attempted insurrection on January 6th. Until such time as Justice Thomas's until Justice Thomas, his wife, and his associates have given a full and public account of their actions under oath and all doubt about the legality or intent of their actions have been found to be honorable, I cannot and will not support this bill. I urge my colleagues to respect those who have served to defend our democracy from all threats, foreign and domestic, to oppose this bill. Mr. President, with that, I yield the well. Senator has yielded the well. Senator from the 36, you wish to rise? Thank you, Mr. President. Colleagues, I rise to speak against uh, this proposal to place a statue of Clarence Thomas on Capitol Hill. 
and I'll spend a couple of minutes reminding you that the last time this was before this body, I brought, a, I brought a, uh, an amendment to add Jenny Thomas alongside Justice Clarence Thomas. I didn't draw that amendment again, but history supports the fact that we should approach this with great caution. The wife of Clarence Thomas was called and testified before the investigatory committee uh, of the House around the January 6th insurrection. She affirmed that she turned over all relevant communications to the committee when she testified. Then she's shown an email in which she endorsed the idea of state legislatures rejecting the outcome and appointing electors for Trump. And she failed to turn over this email to the committee. And she virtually confirmed she had a conversation with her husband, Justice Clarence Thomas, apparently about the election while she was trying to overturn it. And she was texting Mark Meadows. I would point out that there is a cloud across this term of service of Justice Clarence Thomas that, that uh, launched before he ever got the appointment to the Supreme Court uh, with the uh, infamous Anita Hill hearings of the Judiciary Committee of the U.S. Senate and the sexual harassment charges that uh, received wide uh, publicity across the nation and to uh, a testimony given by Anita Hill, to, which she still upholds as being true. We fast forward over the, the service of Justice Thomas, and we see that when Roe v. Wade was overturned, a 50-year precedent in the, uh, uh, a ruling that guaranteed women the right to make their decisions about their own bodies, uh, that when that ruling was un undermined, uh, Justice Thomas wrote an opinion uh, in support of the majority opinion of the court to undo Roe v. Wade, and in that, in, in, in that writing, he claimed that this is just the beginning. We've got to go on and look at uh, other measures like uh, the uh, right to marriage for uh, people of the same gender. We need to go on and look at whether or not married couples have the right to contraception. All this is in writing. This is the Clarence Thomas that we're talking about putting the statue up here on, on, state, on Capitol Hill. I would say to you colleagues, the wise thing to do is to lay this aside because we have seen since the last time this measure was before this body that Justice Thomas has continued to have a cloud over his deliberations and conduct. I will point out the fact that his wife, Jenny Thomas, earns $700,000 a year in family, income to her family uh, for lobbying. Justice Thomas failed to disclose that in the required disclo the disclosures required of uh, Supreme Court justices. It was an oversight, $700,000 that his wife receives and the woman who called up Chief of Staff Mark Meadows uh, several times on the day of the uh, insurrection and leading up to it testified. So Justice Thomas just said he, he forgot about that $700,000. But you know, when you have a lifetime appointment, you're kind of above the law, if you will. And, and that's why I, I search, just, just use common sense. What else is going to come, uh, unfold before us uh, as long as this man is on the bench in the United States uh, Supreme Court? What else are we, we going to see happen that continues this cloud that hovers over his service? Uh, I would urge you to, uh, I, did not, I, I did not introduce, I did not bring my amendment which was offered uh, last time uh, to make a point that his service is problematic. There's a cloud over his service uh, 
since as he approached the Supreme Court uh, while, he was, while he was heading up the EEOC and as he, approached, at, at, at his, as he sought the appointment to the Supreme Court. And that cloud continues today. Who forgets that you have a $700,000 household income from your wife's lobbying fees and you don't report it? And you're on the Supreme Court and you don't know the law about reporting? I'm just telling you, there's a big cloud over the service of Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas. We would be wise to reject this measure before us today. I will yield for any questions. If there are none, I'll yield the well. You have no questions, Senator. Senator from the 10th, you wish to rise? Thank you, Mr. President and members of his body. Uh, this is one of those occasions where you don't know if you should really rise or you should stay in your seat because of the ambivalence you feel toward a bill that we're discussing that you find so many issues and so many problems with. First of all, let me just say that I want to thank the senator from the first who had the courage to stand in as well and entertain questions and even express to us his sensitivity about bringing this legislation. And I'm glad that I asked him that question about how he felt about this particular legislation because I just want to take a few moments to tell you how I feel about this legislation. I remember last year when this same bill came before us, I stood up here and I made a comment and the comment that I said basically encapsulated my feelings about this particular legislation. And let me remind you, I'm not talking about the man because certainly Justice Thomas is extremely accomplished. What I'm talking about is what this person has done, what his policies, what his votes that he's taken on issues and how that had an effect, particularly on people like me, people of color. I also remember last year when this bill came before us and a different lieutenant governor was presiding over this body, I raised a question about his wife and I was summarily shut down. You know, I had an opportunity to go back while I was on a trip that some of you may have heard about with the then lieutenant governor. I asked him, I said, Governor, I remember when we were discussing Justice Thomas and you and I raised this issue about his wife and you summarily shut me down, but since then, a whole lot more information has come out about her participation in the January 6th insurrection. He shared with me that, Senator, I probably should have let you go ahead and ask that particular question. So even the then Lieutenant Governor has some reservations that he expressed to me not so very long ago about this particular person about this particular legislation. And I know it's very, very sensitive to talk about race in this body, but any time that we have a resolution, legislation proposing to place a statue of Clarence Thomas on this grounds, we cannot avoid that conversation, so I'm not going to avoid it either. In the black community, we have uh, an expression, and I don't want to use this label too deeply here because I'm just trying to tell you what we have in the African American community. When we talk about a person of color that goes back historically to the days of slavery and that person betraying his own community, we have a term in the black community. That term that we use is called uh, Uncle Tom. And Uncle Tom is a either a fictional or non-fictional character. I don't really know the origin of Uncle Tom, but it talks about a person who back during the days of slavery sold his soul to the slave masters. That's the story, the fictitious st of the story of an Uncle Tom. So when we think about a person in the black community who's accomplished, but yet policies seek to subvert some may even say suppress the achievements and accomplishments of people of color. 
I couldn't help but to think about that term in expressing my dissatisfaction with this particular legislation. Folks, as I said last year, y'all just don't get it. And I don't expect people of non-color to get the sensitivity that we feel about a person of color whose policies and practices and decisions and votes that we rallied and fought against. But it's not just about people of color. Uh, Justice Thomas' decisions have certainly sparked outrage against women, and not just women of color, but all women. And certainly when we look at the LGBTQ plus community, certainly his votes and positions he's taken has raised outrage in that community as well. He even said, and I have, if anyone want to fact check me, by the way, some of his famous quotes, and I wouldn't say quotes, but some of his famous positions. And let me just kind of share with you what some of those positions are. He said, job discrimination rules don't apply to transgender status. I said they should. He said, anti-gay marriage law is not the same as miscegenation, which I don't know why. He went on to say affirmative action forever discounts black achievements. I don't know too many people of color in this body that haven't benefited from affirmative action. And I'm not talking about action where you give somebody a, a handout, but certainly all of us at some times in our lives even need a hand up. There's a whole laundry list of famous quotes and positions that Justice Thomas has taken that I find offensive. Sometimes when I talk to the majority party, I just have to say, y'all just don't get it. Y'all really just don't get it. But I would hope, as others have said, that we would take this legislation and certainly set it aside. That we would take this legislation and understand the sensitivity that a person like him who's still serving has on people like me, people of color, on people like the senator from the ninth, a woman of color, like the senator over here from the seventh, another woman of color. I would hope that the majority party in here would understand that. And my purpose for standing up here today is just to share that with you. No one's here is bashing his esteemed accomplishments. We're not. We are simply explaining to you how the actions that this man has taken over his terms of service and how it, that impact has had has been on all of us of color. And Mr. President, if there aren't any questions, then I will certainly yield well and take my seat and humbly ask each of you, table this legislation, a vote no. You have, you have no questions, Senator. I yield. Ask the Senator from the first to close debate. Thank you, Mr. President. I'll be very brief. Uh, this is something that is uh, up close and personal for me uh, as being the senator from the first district. Um, Clarence Thomas, his mother, his family from my area. Um, I feel deeply and strongly about this. I would appreciate your vote. Uh, and with that, I would ask your favorable consideration. Senator has yielded the well. Senator from the 42nd, would you? Uh, yes, I'd like to um, ask for unanimous consent to withdraw Amendment 1. Asking unanimous consent to withdraw Amendment 1 without objection. No objection, Amendment number 1 is withdrawn, so.
Is there objection to the agreeing to the reporting of the committee which is favorable to the passage of the bill? All right. Senator, from the yes. 15th, what purpose yeah, do you Mr. rise? President, I uh, ask unanimous consent to excuse, uh, be excused from voting on the Senate Rule 5-1-8. Senator has that right. Is there objection to the Senator's motion? Hearing none. Senator's motion is granted. Is there objection to agreeing on, to the report of the committee which is favorable to the passage of the bill? The chair hears none. The report of the committee is agreed to. Is there objection to the main question being ordered? The chair hears none and the main question is ordered. The question is on the passage of the bill. All those in favor of the bill will vote yay, opposed nay. Secretary will unlock the machine. On the passage of the bill, the yeas are 32, the nays are 20. This bill, having received the requisite constitutional majority, is therefore passed. <laughs> Senate Bill 65, Secretary, read the caption. Senate Bill 65 by Senator Watson of the First and others, a bill to be entitled an act to amend Chapter 1 of Title 33 of the Official Code of Georgia Annotated relating to general provisions so as to authorize the Commissioner of Insurance to take certain actions, including but not limited to promulgating rules, applying for federal monies, and establishing an advisory committee to create, implement, or operate a state, federal, or partnership exchange or marketplace to repeal former exemptions and prohibitions. The Senate Committee on Insurance and Labor recommends that this bill do pass Respectfully submitted, Senator Walker of the 20th Chairman. That completes the order, Mr. President. I recognize Senator from the first to speak to the measure. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I'm here to discuss Senate Bill 65. Uh, this has to do with state-based exchanges. So as you may recall, the ACA, Affordable Care Act, requires that each state utilize a federally operated platform, healthcare.gov, or, and I must say that is or, and is actually preferred from the ACA standpoint, I want to make sure everybody hears that, to operate their own state-based health insurance exchange as the enrollment platform for individuals to shop for and purchase health insurance on the individual market. Georgia has been utilizing healthcare.gov since the ACA first went into effect and passed a law that precludes the state from establishing or operating a state-based exchange, or SBE for short. Thus, Georgia's current structure relies on the federal government for consumer outreach, enrollment assistance, oversight of health plans, and eligibility functions. In contrast, the state-based exchange, which the federal government prefers, this option allows the states to operate and be responsible for all these aspects on the state level without reliance on the healthcare.gov. Currently, 17 states and the District of Columbia operate a state-based exchange. These states in alphabetical order, California, Colorado, Connecticut, Idaho, Kentucky, Maine, Maryland, Massachusetts, Minnesota, Nevada, Nevada, as they pronounce it, New Jersey, New Mexico, New York, Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, Vermont, and Washington. Creating 
a state-based exchange, and Georgia would conceptually allow for Georgia to implement a portion of the state's Georgia access waiver. In other words, that is the 1332 for the waiver, not to DCH, but to the ACA. Because like part two of Georgia access, a state-based exchange would shift enrollees away from the healthcare.gov to a state-operated website, which as you know, has reduced, has reduced health care premiums. While part two of the Georgia Access was paused by the Biden by administration, part one, which lowers the premiums through the state's reinsurance program, is still in effect, as I emphasized. While st still tied to the ACA rules and regulations, a state-based exchange would give the state a greater degree of control over the marketplace operations, giving states the opportunity to improve the operations, better coordinate across programs, and improve consumer outreach and marketing. And I'll give you an example. During COVID-19, many states operating, as I mentioned above, those 17 in District of Columbia, a state-based exchange during the early parts of the COVID-19 pandemic offered special enrollment periods, while the federal government, due to its inflexibility, did not until February 2021. There is the potential for a state to incur a cost savings as a result of operating a state-based exchange also. Since the user fee that the federal government imposes on healthcare.gov would no longer apply. And if Georgia is no longer required to pay these user fees, it could put a savings toward other uses. And let me give you another example. The potential savings, the user fee for plan year 2022, amounts to 2.75% premium for plans administered through healthcare.gov. 2.75% administered by the federal government. Using this user fee, Nevada, as they pronounce it, for plan year 2022, accounting for operating costs and running its own state-based exchange, estimated the state would save six million dollars. In Georgia, savings generally or generated by running a state-based exchange would most likely be directed toward the cost that would incur while operating this platform towards a reinsurance program. OCGA, as mentioned in this, 33-123, would need to be overhauled with a repeal and replace in this code section to grant the insurance commissioner the power to enact a state-based exchange. This code section currently prohibits state agencies from establishing and operating an exchange. Commissioner King supports this legislation and the Office of Commissioner Insurance is prepared and has been prepared to operate a state-based exchange with this, as this legislation passes and is signed into law. And with that, Mr. President, uh, I'll yield the well. I'll ask for your favorable consideration unless there are questions. Mm -hmm. You have no questions, Senator. Thank you. Oh, I'm ask sorry, Senator, you do. You have us from the second. I'm sorry. Senator, okay. from second. Yes, sir. Does the gentleman yield? Absolutely. To my co colleague from the, uh, from the coast. Absolutely. My question, uh, Senator, is what is the plan to ensure a smooth transition for those insured persons and their families? If the state were to move from healthcare.gov to a state-based exchange, what would be uh, the system in place for potential lapses or coverage gaps or issues where an individual may not know how to re-enroll uh, from the change? What's that system or plan? It, it, is, it is a very smooth transition that is going to happen, you know, unlike when the healthcare.gov, under a really compressed time frame, you know, had some challenges there. There's, there's no doubt about that. I think that the record speaks for itself. Actually, the Office of Insurance Commissioner it, it stated in testimony that they've been planning for this for quite some time. They've actually had a six-month run up and they're ready to go. Does the gentleman further yield? Yes. Could you share that plan with the members of this body? I so would we be happy to, yes, absolutely. Thank you. You have no questions, Senator. Thank you, Mr. President. I, I yield the will. <clears throat> Senator from the ninth, do you wish to rise? Thank you, Mr. President. I rise today in opposition to this bill. Although inherently the state-based system it, it, it's not terrible, but I'm not confident that 
this is the course that we should take. And I'm not confident that we're going to have a better system and that all of our data will transfer there seamless and flawless. We already have healthcare.gov. So as, if Georgia is aiming to match what, that experience, we should better spend the money on the system that we have right now. It's not broken. It's working. We might need to spend some dollars to make it better. But I do think moving to a state-based system is just risky. And on this note, the Center on Budget and Policy and Priorities put together the following list of goals for any state considering a state-based marketplace. And there are some things that should be considered. And the states that have adopted a state base, these considerations have been made. I don't really see our, or I have not seen our plan in the state of Georgia that would cover these areas. Uh, and I'm not confident that I got the right questions and the data to cover these areas. But if we, even if we were gonna consider it, we need to set targets for increased enrollment that span all healthcare programs. We need to make sure that the state-based marketplace is prepared to at least match the federal marketplace's user, ex user experience and identify improvements that the state-based ex exchange can make right away. We need to prioritize significant investments in marketing, outreach, and enrollment ins assistance to make sure that we don't have people dropping off uh, in the transfer. We need to commit to the no, no wrong door policy that some states have already done. And it is the eligibility and enrollment system in which people who apply for health coverage are easily enrolled in the appropriate program, whether that plan is found on a state-run marketplace, Medicaid, or other state programs. And make immediate stride towards the non, no wrong door policy. We have not adopted that. I haven't heard a plan for the non no wrong door policy here. And it's not outlined in the legislation. We need to ensure that spending will be sufficient to provide high quality services to residents and achieve the state's other goals for transition. We need to protect cons consumers from subpar health plans and problematic web broker and insurer market marketing, practice marketing practices. We don't have those insurance assurances on this piece of legislation. We need to leverage the establishment of a state marketplace to advance broader policy changes, such as additional subsidies, to make the coverage more affordable. Nor did I see the hard data on the savings that states that have adopted a state-based system, I haven't seen data on how much they are saving. So I just have some huge concerns. I think it, um, it's a big change for the state, and I think it's one that I feel might be a little risky. We don't want people falling off. We don't want people not having coverage. We want to make sure that people have um, health insurance options that are not subpar, and I just don't feel like this legislation addresses that. So I'm asking for a no vote, and Mr. President, if I don't have any questions, I'll yield the well. You do have a couple questions, Senator. Senator from 22nd, do you wish? Yes, thank you, Mr. President. Is Senator Yill? Yes. Just one question. One of the things that the federal government does is do, they do outreach programs or what we call navigators and things of that nature to make, make sure persons know what service it or how the website and things like that will work. Has there been any estimates done maybe about how much it might cost the state of Georgia if we make this change? And if so, can you kind of enlighten us about what that number is? I believe that number is $8 million. And does that be additional to some of the money that we're already kind of putting out? Correct. All right. Thank you, Senator. Senator from 36, would you like to rise? Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, does the Senator yield? Yes, ma'am. Uh, appreciate your remarks. And there's a, isn't it true, a long and a rocky road that has brought us to this point today in Georgia of moving in the direction of a state exchange. Is that not true? 
That is correct. Uh, isn't it true that Governor Deal, early in his uh, term, put together the, all the stakeholders in Georgia um, around the table to create a state exchange plan? That, that was before you were a member here. But isn't it true that I have a very clear memory of that uh, because the bill was introduced after months of uh, stakeholders creating a state exchange. I imagine there are several in this body that are unaware of that. Uh, isn't it true? Is it also not true that within a week of introducing that, with the, the Governor Deal's floor leaders introduced a state exchange bill to create a state exchange that was crafted by the stakeholders of Georgia, all those who have skin in the game in the insurance uh, and uh, delivery of, of medical services. Uh, is that not true? The senator with her rich tenure in history knows of what she speaks. Isn't it true that I should probably come to the well to further explain this uh, history that stretches back over several years and is quite enlightening? Is that not true? The senator knows what she speaks. She is very wise. <laughs> Senator, you have no further questions. I yield the well. Senator from the 36th, do you wish to come to the front? Thank you, Mr. President. Colleagues, uh, as I said, there's a long and a rocky road that brings us to this point today. Uh, when uh, Governor Deal was uh, newly in his uh, first term, he convened the stakeholders uh, across the state. And I'm repeating this because I know many people were not here uh, during this point or uh, during this time, and others of us who were here uh, have. Uh, not summons it up in a few years. But when the Governor Deal's stakeholder process, which was countless hours and stretched over many months, really took the entire uh, interim uh, uh, after, his, uh, after, his, after his, uh, he served his first year as a governor, uh, there was a, there was a full-throated effort. Everybody put the shoulder to the wheel to figure out a state ex exchange for Georgia uh, to, s to get on board with the plan to how to have more uh, health coverage for Georgians because you know historically we have one of the highest rates of uninsured population in, this, in the nation. Sad to report that that carefully crafted state exchange concept that again had all the Georgia stakeholders at the table over many months with working groups, subcommittees, etc and a finally crafted bill that uh, was dropped uh, during the first week of the session by the floor leaders for Governor Deal. Well, what did we see unfold before our very eyes but a firestorm? This was the days of the vaunted Tea Party. And boy, did they come down here and stomp around and rattle the chains and point the fingers and hoop and holler and say, this shall not stand. We will not see our government uh, adopt a state exchange plan. Do you know the bill was pulled by the governor's folks within a week because of that? So we were going down a pathway of moving to a state exchange. And you heard the author of this bill read out many states that have a state exchange. and. Uh, That process started back then when, when that option became available to uh, states across the country. Uh, and it was done by uh, largely Democratic governors, but also uh, the uh, governor of uh, Indiana, Governor Mike Pence, put in the plan. So there's nothing inherently wrong headed about a state exchange. What we need to look at, though, is, is the dollars. And, and the haste and the speed of this and uh, understand how complex the issue is and the fact that 
when we go down this road, and I'm, I'm speaking against this bill because I think that mon monetarily it doesn't make good money sense now. Uh, because we have a 700,000 Georgians that are taking advantage of the healthcare.gov uh, uh, channel to get uh, health care and to get your premium uh, partially underwritten uh, by the, uh, the Obamacare funds uh, on the federal level. Right now, uh, as if we move forward to implement the Pathways to Coverage program uh, of Governor Kemp, the state plan, it would cost the state uh, uh, about $75 million and cover about 31,000 Georgians, uh, and it's somewhere around in the $50,000 uh, dollar, uh, arena. But we would get, if we implemented full Medicaid expansion, we'd cover 482,000 Georgians. And guess, guess what the return on our state dollar investment is when we do that? It's $9 for every one, dollar, one state dollar that we, that we spend. That's why we are so insistent on the message that a full expansion of Medicaid would close the coverage gap and would put us on the path to healthier hospitals that can survive, to providers that can run a business delivering health care and be compensated for it. Uh, it. It would infuse, it would create more jobs in the health care in industry, and it would infuse money into our state economy. Nine dollars for every one dollar we spend. Go out and find a match for that investment. I, 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 I think we'd have to look, look far and wide for it. So uh, it, there's nothing implicitly wrong with launching a, a, a state exchange, but as I understand it, in one of the iterations of the governor's proposals, uh, it was it's going to require people to uh, demonstrate employment, uh, volunteering in the community, et cetera, to people who oftentimes are very unwell and very challenged to go be in the workforce, or they're a full-time caregiver for uh, people that they're responsible for, be that children uh, or elderly parents or a sick spouse. So uh, just, just, just to clarify, we had a state exchange plan that was consistent with a lot of other states. It didn't involve, it didn't, in, uh, uh, now we would be throwing a monkey wrench into the whole thing by th Xing out healthcare.gov, which I understand was, was the proposal at some point, and move into a state plan overnight with next to no understanding on, on behalf of those that are voting here today about what that plan would look like. So I think this is, is uh, hasty with uh, many consequences that could be negative for our state. Uh, and the Center for Budget and Policy and the, Georgia Access says, and the Georgia Access Model, they say that this model that's being proposed would likely increase premiums for comprehensive coverage. So that, those are my concerns. Uh, I, I would again expect this to be a party line vote and uh, uh, an unfortunate delay from now to the day that Georgia embraces full Medicaid coverage for our population that are eligible. Thank you. I'll yield the well. Senators yielded, yielded the well. Senator from the first, if you'd like to close the debate. Wow. Listen, I understand health care is complicated. There's no doubt about that. But uh, Senator from 36 uh, was a little confused when it came to the what we're discussing here. We're not discussing the 1115 waiver, which I, I fully support from that perspective. We're discussing the 1330 a ACA waiver. So the obfuscation or the confusion relating to the volunteer work of 20 hours or working part-time for 20 hours or going to voc tech, vocational technical college or going to college relating to the Medicaid waiver of 1115 I mean, sorry, it's an ACA waiver, even I get confused at times, ACA waiver of 1115, which is the Medicaid program, remember? 
The 1332 is the reinsurance. This is bringing down insurance. This is the gap that's not covered. Remember, that was the Supreme Court decision that this area is not covered. Unlike Obamacare, which you're bringing in a failed system of Medicaid, and it's not always failed. Don't worry, don't, I'm not saying it's completely failed, but it is improved, much improved. But this is the reinsurance portion of the 1332 ACA waiver, which is Georgia Access. It is confusing. I get it. No doubt about that. Uh, but it's the thought process is that if we insure people with private insurance in a very flexible manner you drive down premiums and it's better than doing medicaid explosion so i'm sorry don't mean to get uh carried away there all right so um aca with the expansion is what we're talking about the 2.75 percent fee that the federal government is charging now fully funds the state exchange period. You got to remember that the federal government is not as flexible as we can be relating to state government. An example, another example, enrollment time was limited uh, when we we're going through the pandemic. The state can control this, respond more easily, faster, be much more nimble. And don't forget in 2025, just a couple years from now, as functional or dysfunctional as you think Congress is, these subsidies go away. So this ACA plans premiums go up. The state can respond if we need to. And also, next, next point is that, do you really wanna be calling CMS for a problem? with your insurance or with Medicaid, or do you wanna be calling someone locally from Georgia? We can be more responsive. So let's don't confuse the coverage from 100% down, the 1115 waiver, ACA, and what we're doing here, 100% up to 137%, and really 100% up to 400%, right? Because that's what we're really covering here when we, when we do the state navigator and all the other things that go along with that so uh, I don't think this is in haste by any means it was well explained in the insurance committee by Greg Conley lawyer for the insurance commissioner been working on this for six months a good transition certainly much better than the healthcare.gov transition that we had that was just ferocious i think we can all agree with that that was just not very smooth and uh, hey listen in their defense it was a short time period they didn't use a good computer computer company they regrouped and they they did get it right eventually we're not going to have that problem um so anyway, that's, I just wanted to, I needed to clarify those things of what we're actually doing here. Uh, it's pretty simple. What was done back then that the senator from the 36th mentioned was relating to politics. Remember the repeal and replace that was still on the table? Senator John McCain doing the thumbs down, do you remember that? That was still an option at that time. Would it have been a better option? Maybe, we'll never know that. This is where we are right now. And this is what we need to do here in Georgia. This is what we're running on. The Biden administration admittedly made a huge mistake because we spent a lengthy time getting it approved through CMS. Two and a half years, right? Longer, that's a pretty long time when it comes to getting this done right. So when the Biden administration sued and took us to federal court, it was a slam dunk because they lost on everything to the point that they didn't even want to appeal. And I'm sorry, but I don't mean to make it political, but that's the reality. They didn't appeal because they knew they were gonna lose again. And then it may go to the Supreme Court and then it could be used as a precedent for other states to do it the Georgia way. That's sort of obvious, it's the truth. I didn't wanna go there, but that's where we are. Mr. President, this is a very simple bill. It's undo undoing uh, some legislation that was done 
in 2014, I stood over in the house looking at Representative Jason Spencer at the time, teaming up with others running for Congress, thinking that, oh my goodness, you know, if this doesn't come to fruition and so forth, we may have to undo that bill. And we certainly did. Thank you very much. Mr. President, I yield the will. Thank you, Senator. Does any other Senator wish to speak for or against the measure? The chair hears none. Is there objections to the previous question being ordered? The chair hears none and the previous question is ordered. Is there objection to agreeing to the report on the committee which is favorable to the patch of the bill? The chair hears none. The report of the committee is agreed to. Is there objection to the main question being ordered? The chair hears none and the main question is ordered. The question is on the passage of the bill. All those in favor of the bill will vote yay, oppose nay. Secretary will unlock the machine. On the passage of the bill, the yeas are 32, nays are 19. This bill, having received the requisite constitutional majority, is therefore passed. <laughs> Senate Bill 41. Secretary, read the caption. Senate Bill 41 by Senator Williams of the 25th and others, a bill to be entitled an act to amend Article 1 of Chapter 7 of Title 52 of the Official Code of Georgia Annotated relating to registration, operation, and sale of watercraft generally so as to require completion of a boater education course for registration of a watercraft. The Senate Committee on Public Safety recommends that this bill do pass. Respectfully submitted, Senator Albers, Chairman. Mr. President, that completes the order. Senators from 25th, for what purpose do you rise? Our request at the Senate table, Senate Bill 41. Senator has requested that Senate Bill 41 be tabled. Is there objection to that request? Hearing no objection, that bill is tabled. Senator, that was going to be your first bill, wasn't it? A little, a little intimidated by the way a little bit there, huh? It's okay. That's okay. You'll have another shot at it. Moving on, Senate Bill 42. Secretary, read the caption. Senate Bill 42 by Senator Hodges of the of the third and others, a bill to be entitled an act to amend code section 16547 of the official code of Georgia annotated relating to posting model notice with human trafficking hotline information in businesses and on internet so as to increase the fine for failure to comply with model notice requirements. The Senate Committee on Public Safety recommends that this bill do pass. Respectfully submitted Senator Albers of the 56th chairman. Mr. President, that completes the order. If I could have the chamber's attention we we had one freshman senator who opted out of having his bill fully vetted but we actually have another one here and he's already broken the rules of the senate because he's gotten up from his chair before he's called upon so uh, but but a uh, senator if, uh, if it's okay with you we'd like to call you to present your bill senator senator from the third so Thank you, Mr. President. I was just testing, <clears throat> testing Senator Robertson over there, <laughs> and he called me on it. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President and fellow colleagues. I rise today to bring you a bill championed by the governor and first lady, Senate Bill 42, uh, building upon, <clears throat> excuse me, building upon first lady and the Grace Commission's mission to bring awareness to and one day eradicate human trafficking, the Kemp administration's pursuing this bill. 
During the Grace Commission process, the governor's office was contacted by a constituent questioning the current fine structure within OCGA 16-5-7, which imposes penalties when certain businesses fail to post a notice containing the human trafficking hotline information in the bathroom of said business or prominent location of said business. The code section was established in 2013 and only set maximum fines for the offense of not posting notice. Currently, if a business owner is found to be in noncompliance after 30 days from the date of receiving written notification from a law enforcement officer stating the business is noncompliance with the code section, the owner is guilty of a misdemeanor and may be charged with a fine of up to $500. If a business owner is charged with a second or subsequent offense, said owner is guilty of a high and aggravated misdemeanor and must be charged with a fine of up to $5,000. The governor's office seeks to set minimum amounts for these fines to ensure that business, businesses take this law seriously. Human trafficking is a horrific plague on our society we must all take necessary steps to end it. Um, this bill provides a little more teeth to help people take this very serious issue a little more seriously. Uh, once more to summarize the bill, it updates OCGA 16-5-47-D1 to set minimum and maximum fines imposed upon certain businesses for compliance, to post notice issued by the Georgia Bureau of Investigation outlining the, nation, the National Human Traffic Resource Center phone number and the statewide Georgia hotline for human trafficking phone number. First offense, not less than $500, no more than $1,000. The second or subsequent offense, not less than $1,000, nor more than $5,000. I ask for your favorable consideration. With that, Mr. President, I will yield for any questions. Yeah, you do have a number of questions, Senator. Senator from the 19th. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator, do you yield? I yield. Senator, um, is it not true that this is a very important topic and probably one we should not ask you questions that we normally would ask questions of senators for their first time in the well? I think the senator knows of what he speaks. That being said, though, when you violate Senate rules, does that possibly change the dynamic of that discussion? Uh, it could very possibly well do that. Yes, Senator, Senator, are you aware, uh, Senator, do you further yield? I do. The, are you aware of Senate Rule 1-9-1.13? Uh, uh, I am not. It says that reading materials that are not pertinent to the Senator or to the Senate, Senate's discussion shouldn't be included uh, on the Senator's desk. Uh, are you aware of that? Uh, I am not. When we're looking right now at your desk, I think you've got a copy of the budget. Is that true? Well, it wasn't there when I left, Senator. <laughs> Senator, do you further yield? I do. As a freshman, are you on appropriations? I am not. Senator, do you further yield? I do. Would you agree with me then that the budget is probably not pertinent to anything that you are doing as a freshman in the Senate? I certainly hope that's not true. <laughs> Senator, do you further yield? If that's the Senator's position, I'll accept it and I'll yield further. Senator, it, we also have rules about decorum in the Senate, making sure that the chamber works properly, that everyone's views are respected and, and everyone's heard. Are you aware of those rules? I think I'm about to be, Senator. <laughs> Senator, I, I'm going to point to this area of the Senate. Can you tell me who the person, he kind of looks like uh, Santa Claus or someone's grandfather, who I might be pointing to? That is the right honorable. Randy Robertson. Oh, oh, oh. No. Senator, I, 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 he him. also is the senator from the 29th. Senator, I think you've called on to the rules. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much. I, I yield. You got, you got a lot of questions here, Senator. Um, Senator's from the 17th. Does Senator yield? I do. Senator, is this the first lady's bill? It is a bill that was um, that came out of the efforts of the Grace Com uh, Commission, which uh, the First Lady Marty Kemp chaired. So is that a yes? That's a yes. Do you further yield? Yes, sir. 
Senator, isn't it true, but years before you got here, the Senator 19th and I were full leaders for the governor and actually carried a bill for the First Lady on this floor? If you say so, sir. Do you further yield? I do. Isn't it true when we did that, I believe it was in 2019, that was her first bill, we actually invited the First Lady to come on the floor, and she stood right over there by <laughs> that old fireplace when we presented that bill. Do you, isn't that true? Um, if you say so, sir, and it was an honorable thing to do. Do you further yield? I do. Senator, if this is the First Lady's bill, why is she not here today? Ooh. Senator, I do not know the answer to that. Do you further yield? I do. Senator, did you invite the First Lady to be here today as you presented her bill? Ooh. Senator, I did not. Mm. Do you further yield? I do. Is the reason you did not invite the First Lady to be here today is because she actually does not support this bill? Uh, no, sir. That is, that is not the case, I am sure. Do you further yield? I do. So then you just didn't want to show off the First Lady on the Florida Senate today as you presented her bill? Senator, I'm just going to, I'm going to, I'm going to plead ignorance. <laughs> With that, we can agree. Thank ignorance you. Ignorance of. <laughs> <laughs> Senator, Thank you, you, Senator. You're welcome to yield the well at any time, Senator. Uh, you know, I, I think it's about time. I yield the well, so. It's the wisest Thank thing you. you said all day, Senator. So. All right. Good job, Senator. Good job. Does any other senator wish to speak for or against the measure? Chair hears none. Is there objection to the previous question being ordered? Chair hears none, and the previous question is ordered. Is there objection to agreeing to the report on committee which is favorable to the passage of the bill? Chair hears none. The report of the committee is agreed to. Is there objection to the main question being ordered? Chair hears none, and the main question is ordered. The question is on the passage of the bill. All those in favor of the bill will vote yay. All those opposed nay. Secretary will unlock the machine. On the passage of the bill, the yeas are 51, nays are 1. This bill, having received the requisite constitutional majority, is therefore passed. Congratulations, Senator. <laughs> Senator, from the 33rd, for what purpose do you rise? Trying to get it there. We got a little. We got a little problem with the uh, glitch here. Oh, happy Valentine's! That's right. <laughs> All right, moving on. <clears throat> Senate Resolution 65, Secretary will read the caption. Senate Resolution 65 by Senator Kennedy of the 18th and others, a resolution recognizing and commending the work and achievements of Greater Georgia Action Incorporated, as well as its chairwoman, former United States Senator Kelly Leffler. The Senate Committee on Rules recommends that this resolution do pass, respectively submitted Senator Brass of the 28th chairman. Mr. President, that completes the order. I recognize the Senator from the 18th to speak to the measure.
Thank you, Mr. President. Good afternoon, colleagues. Uh, I won't tarry long with this. This is a simple resolution that honors our former United States Senator Kelly Leffler. As you know, she was appointed to represent Georgia in the United States Senate upon the retirement of Johnny Isaacson. She is a self-made businesswoman and a political outsider in Washington who went and served very honorably on the Senate Ag Committee, the Veterans Affairs Committee, the HELP, and the Joint Economic Development Committee. She also donated every Senate paycheck to charities across the state of Georgia to fulfill her commitment of delivering results and servant leadership while she was in office representing us. After the time in the Senate, she continued her calling to serve by founding Greater Georgia Action in 2021, a statewide voter mobilization effort. Greater Georgia works on the ground to register new voters, engage diverse communities, and protect election integrity year-round. This organization uh, has engaged in educating and registering voters and engages in diverse and unrepresented communities, underrepresented communities. I could go on and on about Senator Leffler, but I think it's a simple resolution. It's very appropriate that we honor her service, and I offer that and offer this resolution for your consideration. With that, Mr. President, I'll answer any questions or I'll be happy to yield the well. Senator from 33rd, were you trying to ask a question or was that he just left his light on? Senator from 42nd, do you wish to ask a question? I would. Thank you, Mr. President. Will the gentleman yield? I do. I'm, cu I'm curious about what you would, how you would characterize the partisan leaning of Greater Georgia. The partisan leaning of Greater Georgia. Yes. For well, like a, you know, a resolution from the whole body in that, in that context. That's why I'm asking, how would you? Well, understand we're not it? honoring Greater Georgia. We're honoring Kelly Leffler, who's a former United States Senator. That's what this resolution honors. Um, one specific data point I would give you, Senator, is that over 2 million voters were registered pursuant to her work with Greater Georgia, but around 950,000 identified themselves as right-leaning. So based on that metric alone, less than half of the people registered would be identified as right-leaning or conservative. The organization did many things, including registering voters and trying to represent and work with underrepresented communities. Thank you, um, uh, Senator. Will you yield for a yes. question? Yes, sure. What, I, maybe I'm misreading this, but as I read it, the vast majority of the paragraphs are actually about Greater Georgia, not former Senator Leffler, which is why I asked the question. Because I think, isn't it true that if it were just honoring Senator Leffler and you know maybe her career at uh, in finance, her, her stint as a U.S. Senator, or, you know, maybe her, the history-making space regarding women senators from, from Georgia, that, that to me is a different thing than, than, than most of it, which is about greater Georgia, which is why I was posing the question. And the way I read this, isn't it true, there, the vast majority of it is truly about greater Georgia. There is a lot about Greater Georgia in this and her efforts. And depending upon your lens through which you look, Senator, you can view it that way. It is honoring Senator Kelly Leffler. I would also suggest that if, in fact, the new yardstick is going to be from senators or from the minority party, is going to be viewed, viewed whether or not we honor someone solely through the lens of what their political leanings are, that may be a, a, a shift in how we honor folks in this chamber. I'm not sure that's a shift that is really appropriate or that we ought to take. Well, Senator, isn't it true that that's the exact reason I raise my question? I mean, it says recognizing and commending the work and achievements of Greater Georgia Action, Inc., as well as its chairwoman. And isn't it true that in my mind, there's a distinction between the person, Senator Leffler, and her accomplishments both in and outside the political space and the work of Greater Georgia, which I think we can all agree is a more partisan organization. So I'm drawing that distinction. To, to your exact point, I would agree with you if what I felt this did was what you just were referencing. My question is whether or not that, that truly is what it's doing, in which case I think it's a little bit different than sort of the standard let's honor you know, this, this individual for uh, achievements that, that anyone with any partisan lens could recognize are important. Thank you for your engagement. 
I, I understand, I think I understand what you've communicated, but I would also say if you go back and comb through the other resolutions that many other senators offer, they will have and be viewed through the lens of work on political issues, political ideas, political parties, and nonetheless, this Senate chamber honorably represents and honors, excuse me, uh, folks that members bring resolutions for being honored on a routine basis. Thank you. You're welcome. You have no further questions, Senator. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd <laughs> urge a vote, a positive vote on this, a yes vote. Let's honor Kelly Leffler and the work that she's done in representing us. Thank you. Does any other senator wish to speak for or against the measure? Chair hears none. Is there objection to the previous question being ordered? Chair hears none and the previous question is ordered. Is there objection to agreeing to the report on the committee which is favorable to the adoption of the resolution? Chair hears none and the, the report of the committee is agreed to. Is there objection to the main question being ordered? Chair hears none and the main question is ordered. Question is on the adoption of the resolution. All those in favor of the resolution will vote yay. All those opposed nay. Secretary will unlock the machine. On the adoption resolution, the yeas are 31, the nays are 17. This resolution having received the requisite constitutional majority, therefore, it is adopted. <laughs> Moving on, last measure on the calendar, Senate Bill 27. Secretary, read the caption. Senate Bill 27 by Senator Brasso the 28th and others, a bill to be entitled an act to amend code section 33-6-4 of the official code of Georgia annotated. Relating to the enumeration of unfair methods in, of competition and unfair or deceptive acts or practices and penalty, so as to prohibit a health care insurer from requiring an ophthalmologist or optometrist to extend any discounts on services that are not covered eye care services. The Senate Committee on Insurance and Labor recommends that this bill do pass. Respectfully submitted, Senator Walker, Chairman. Mr. President, that completes the order. Senator from the 28th to speak to the measure. Thank you, Mr. President. I almost didn't hear you because I didn't hear you say distinguished but that's okay um, <laughs> colleagues I bring to you Senate Bill 27 and uh, we actually passed this bill out last year uh, and simply what it does is it it stops the practice of insurers forcing optometrists and ophthalmologists to give a discount in which the insurer insurers are not going to provide any kind of compensation towards that discount. Uh, we, we tried to stop the practice last year. Uh, there was a loophole that was found, and so we are simply closing that loophole. And for any of you, those of you that have been around here longer than a session, you know that optometrists and ophthalmologists don't always get along, but uh, today on Valentine's Day, they are getting along and they are both supporting this bill. So with that, I'll yield for questions. You have no questions, Senator. Thank you. I look forward to everyone's support on SB 27, and I yield the will. Senator has yielded. Does any senator wish to speak for or against the measure? Chair hears none. Is there objection to the previous question being ordered? Chair hears none. The previous question is ordered. 
Is there objection to agreeing to the report of the committee which is favorable to the passage of the bill? The chair hears none. The reporting of the committee is agreed to. Is there objection to the main question being ordered? The chair hears none. The main question is ordered. The question is on the passage of the bill. All those in favor of the bill will vote yay. Opposed, nay. Secretary will unlock the machine. Senator from, Senator from the 28th. Use this next time you go to the well, please. <laughs> that way we can see this thing out of eye. <laughs> so. Parliamentary inquiry. State your inquiry. Is it not true that I don't want you to be my Valentine anymore? <laughs> <laughs> Senator knows what he speaks. Mm -hmm. On the passage of the bill, the yeas are 51, the nays are zero. This bill, having received the requisite constitutional majority, is therefore passed. <clears throat> I recognize the majority leader for a motion. Thank you, Mr. President. I move the Senate stand adjourned until 10 a.m. on Wednesday, February 15th. Secretary will read the announcements. The Rules Committee meeting will happen upon adjournment in 450 of the Capitol. The Children and Families Committee meeting is canceled. The Education and Youth Committee meeting will happen at 2.30 p.m. in 450 of the Capitol. The Regulated Industries and Utilities Committee meeting will happen at 4 p.m. in 450 of the Capitol. Mr. President, that completes the order. The Majority Leader has moved that the Senate stand adjourned until 10 a.m. February 15th. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. All those opposed, no. The eyes clearly have it. We're adjourned. Happy Valentine's. <laughs>